anyone else who's managed to harm them. More information at justicelawyer.com. Right now, the uh, federal government has changed its position in uh, a, uh, an appeal in the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeal and has now taken the position that they want the court to declare the entire Affordable Care Act unconstitutional. Whether they will do that at the Ninth Circuit or at the Supreme Court remains to be seen, but it becomes all the more important to talk about state alternatives. And the topic today is uh, a single-payer health care right for Oregon seems to be very appropriate at this time. We have two thoughtful commentators on this, pro on this topic. John Charles of the Cascade Policy Institute and Samuel Metz of the Oregon Physicians uh, for National Health Care. They will discuss the pros and cons of single-payer health care, and each presenter will outline the argument for each side. John Charles Jr. has been president and CEO of the Cascade Policy Institute since 2004. Cascade Policy Institute is a free market think tank working to promote individual liberty, economic opportunity, personal responsibility, uh, here at the CAC University of Pittsburgh, and the last is supporting space. Samuel Metz is a retired anesthesiologist who trained in Stanford, a member of Oregon Physicians for National Health Care Program, and a founder of Man is Health Doctors, both of which advocate for universal health care. Sam uh, is well known to some of the people here at City Club as one of the founding members of the statewide City Club Consortium, and he is now our uh, fearless leader uh, of, of that organization. As a sign of the courtesy and uh, civility that City Club encourages, the two of them drove down from Portland together. So, <laughs> so I don't know which, which I'm going to speak to first, Sam. Dr. Samuel Metz. Well, thank you, Joel. Uh, let's hold your applause for the end, because I suspect it might be a little lopsided given my uh, work at the City Club here. Show of hands, how many people here would agree with the statement that the United States healthcare system may have its flaws, but it's the best in the world? Oh. Oh, come on. Somebody here watches Fox News. That's good. Okay. It's, it's harder and harder to defend that contention. The United States pays twice as much for healthcare as the average industrialized country. We're the most expensive country in the world. If we were twice as healthy as other countries, that would be acceptable, but we're not. If we were just as healthy but paying twice as much, that might be tolerable, but we're not. On almost every measure of public health and medical outcomes, the United States is ranked last or near last in the industrialized world. Also, it's bankrupting families. Health care is the principal cause of bankruptcy in the U.S. and most of those families had insurance at the time the medical crisis began. Medical bankruptcy is an American disease. You will not lose your home paying for treatment for a treatable disease anywhere else. We are the only country that has labor management disputes over health care. It's the principal cause of strikes, lockouts, and other disputes. We're the only country where this happens because we're the only country in which we expect our employers to pick our insurance, our physicians, and our benefits. How do we fix that? Well, first, what are we trying to achieve? Some people say, get the government out of healthcare. Some people say, get the government into healthcare. Some people say get the profit out of health care. Some people say get the profit into health care. Some people say it's a social obligation. Other people say it's personal responsibility. Here's how most of us as heads of family will be thinking about a successful health care system to give our families access when things are good. Will my family get health care no matter how hired, 
fired, retired, or expired, I become. <laughs> Second, cost. We have to reduce cost. And remember, whether we pay for cost by taxes, by out-of-pocket payments or premiums, it's all our money. That total sum has to go down, not just be related. And finally, we want better care. I don't want to have to tell a member of my family who becomes pregnant that there are 59 other countries where she and her baby have a better chance of surviving pregnancy. Now, how are we going to do that? Let me get a little pin-headed to on you for a minute and say any public policy has three basic approaches. We can either keep doing what we're doing and hope for something different. Now, there's a medical diagnosis for that condition. <laughs> Unhappily, the best example of that is the Affordable Care Act. The Affordable Care Act changed the rules, but it's still a zero-sum game. The only way one person can get more health care for less money is for somebody else to get less health care for more money. The second approach is to try things that have never been done before in health care, an experiment. Or items that worked outside, within health care but haven't been shown to work. These are health savings accounts, Medicaid buy-ins, high insurance risk pools, uh, block grants, consumer driven health care. These are all good ideas, the emphasis being on ideas. They haven't been shown to provide better care to more people for less money yet. Lastly, we can look at nations at examples that provide access, lower cost, and better outcomes, that is, better care to more people for less money, and learn from them. That's difficult, easy, and difficult. It's difficult because, sorry, it's easy because every other industrialized nation provides better care to more people for less money. The hard part is they're all different. It's not all socialized medicine out there. Right about it. There isn't any socialized medicine anywhere uh, outside the U.S. But it's easy because they all have one concept in common. That's universal health care. What does universal health care mean? It means first, we have a health care system with mandated prepaid participation in a health care plan. No one can be excluded. No one can opt out. Second, there's one set of comprehensive benefits for everyone. Comprehensive does not mean unlimited. It means treatable conditions and treatment. And finally, there's one network. Any patient can see any physician. And provider payment reflects the value of the service, not the value of the insurance. There are two ways to achieve universal health care around the world. One is private health insurance. That's used in Central Europe and Japan. Now, be aware that in the European Central, excuse me, European private health insurance resembles American health insurance the way European football resembles American football. Different games, different rules, and different goals. The other way is with single payer. Everyone contributes to a fund, all providers are paid out of the fund. In private health insurance, it is privately funded, that is, we pay premiums, and it's privately provided, that is, the providers are all independent, they are not government. Single payer, we pay publicly with taxes but the providers are still independent, not governmental. If you're going to pick one or the other, the only advantage the single payer has if you're going to go to universal health care is it's simple. How does single payer health care provide better care to more people for less money? You know, that, that doesn't compute. Here in the U.S., we know that the only way to get better care to more people is to pay more money. Single-payer work, 
by eliminating half of the administrative costs in insurance. About 30% of all of our healthcare spending in the U.S. goes to non-medical personnel who try to figure out if we're getting the healthcare that we didn't pay for and to stop. Now, that administrative cost in single-payer countries is about a quarter of that. If we could cut our administrative costs by using single-payer just in half, not 75%, we would recover enough money that we're already spending to pay for the unmet health care needs in the United States. So that's the case. We want better care to more people for less money. Single payer around the world provides better care to more people for less money. And it does it not by cutting care, not by cutting benefits, but by cutting administrative costs. And you're going to have a chance to ask questions afterwards, but John and I are going to be exchanging here. So I'll turn the mic over to John. Thanks, Sam. Uh, when I was introduced, they said I had been at Cascade Policy Institute since 2004, uh, which is true. I started there in 1997. And before that, I spent 17, almost 17 years running the Oregon Environmental Council, which is philosophically in a pretty far other place on the political spectrum. So um, because of my unusual career background, I say that probably almost any opinion you have about public policy, I either share it now or I once shared it. <laughs> so um, I'll just kind of start with that. And, Cascade is uh, in their, we're in our 28th year, I think, and we're interested in all kinds of policy issues, uh, and healthcare is one of them because it's, uh, well, Medicaid by itself is the most expensive thing that the state of Oregon pays for. In my opinion, two reasons why healthcare is so expensive and dysfunctional is the over-reliance on third-party payers and the lack of market-based pricing. And a single payer system will make both of those problems worse. A couple stories in that regard to kind of point that out. About 20 years ago, when I wasn't thinking about health care policy at all, I had a minor sports injury and went to my physician out in Welch's, Oregon. And he said, Oh, well, you should get an MRI in your knee there. And I said, Okay, well, where do I go for that? And he said, Well, wherever your insurance can be held you to. And they said, well, I don't, I don't have insurance. He said, oh, well, don't get it then. It's not worth it if you're paying yourself. <laughs> okay, I thought, you know, I'm not, this is not my feet. I'm not following healthcare policy. That's the first time I started thinking seriously about what do you mean? If it's my money, it's not worth it. But if there's some third party Santa Claus, then just go do it. Is that how you guys work here? Then about five years ago, my dermatologist had found a precancerous growth in my arm that was a solvable problem but it needed some surgery, so I was going in, and uh, he numbed my arm up, and he's cutting into it, and, uh, but I'm awake. He says, don't, don't look at this. He and his assistant are doing their thing, there's blood everywhere. But we're just having, a, it's kind of weird, have a casual conversation about well, what do you do for a living, et cetera, and he's cutting my arm. And uh, so we got to talk, yeah, I work in think tank, et cetera, and we talked about healthcare policy, and, and I talked about this issue of pricing and lack of transparency, and I said, well, for instance, you told me I needed to do this, but you never talked about how much it's going to be and whether, you know, what my opinion was. He said, so by the way, how much is this going to cost? And he says, I don't know. He said, I just come in and do this stuff. I go around here and I just cut people and do stuff. He says, I don't worry about prices. That's someone else's problem. <laughs> so I was tempted to say something a little snarky there, but since he was the one holding all the sharp objects, I decided to be very respectful. But I thought, you know, exactly how many of you in the audience professionally go to work or used to go to work if you're retired and sell a good or a service or a product or something, and you never, ever think about price. You just kind of go around like Mr. Magoo, yeah, just some of those stuff. Someone else, the money just flows. Okay, so you tell me to go get something 
not because I'm going to pay. It's not worth it if I pay. It's only worth it if someone else pays. And furthermore, you don't even know what prices are. Okay, multiply that by millions and millions of transactions, and you begin to see <clears throat> what is the problem here. And single payer advocates, and, and there are a lot of different iterations of what single payer is, so I'll just say in general, they want to redirect <clears throat> all dollars to Medicare, Medicaid, and employer, private employer health care into one system. I mean, as a practical matter, it would require waivers from the federal government to do that, which would either be really difficult or impossible. And if you're talking about taking over private companies, <clears throat> uh, their shareholders are likely to get wiped out. And some of you who have mutual funds probably have positions in those companies. And if your stock position ends up dropping like a nosedive, you might not be so keen on the idea of shareholders getting wiped out. Uh, this will require, whether it's federally or the state, lots of new taxes. Uh, Dr. Metzgerka and Task Force that over this past year to produce a report in December 2018, which if you are interested in this, you can read the report because it's shock full of information about this. And they talked about all kinds of potential new taxes on sales, employment, hospitals, income, okay, lots of new taxes. There's no Santa Claus here. They want to force the 245,000 Oregonians currently not insured to buy coverage, even though 29% of them have explicitly stated that they are, quote, not interested. <clears throat> and their mantra is, as he said, everyone in, no one out. Everyone in, no escape. Advocates acknowledge that a single payer system would, according to the report of his task force, Will potentially reduce choices of consumers, employers, and bargaining units, and would worsen service availability, meaning more delays, as what happens when you end up rationing, and long delays are probably the most common feature of the Canadian system. A few states have tried to do this in recent years, and none have succeeded. And I don't think Oregon would succeed. So I think this is a pretty academic conversation. I have a much more modest goal. Here. I want to legalize health insurance. That's right, it's now illegal. What is insurance? Uh, it's a pooled risk program characterized by low monthly, quarterly, annual premiums, in which you pay most of what you want out of pocket for very moderate things in real time, in real prices, in real markets. And your insurance designed to protect you from the unexpected, low probability, high cost event that would wipe you out. Under real insurance, all risk factors are considered. Or auto insurance. Most of you probably have auto insurance. I've had it since I was 17. <clears throat> auto insurance, your policy, whoever issues it is going to consider your age, gender, smoking habits, number of moving violations recently and lifetime. Distance from work. The lower your risk, the lower your premiums. It's very rational. I don't ever want to talk to my auto insurance company, and I don't. Uh, no, they're only insuring me against some big event that's very unlikely to happen. If you prevent insurers from analyzing risk factors, as is now the case, and mandating minimum benefits, as is now the case, then it's not an insurance product. It is what you call, generically call healthcare coverage. It's just not an insurance product. We don't allow catastrophic care policies. We mandate prepaid health care, which destroys prices and increases costs. It is essentially an all-you-can-eat buffet. Your local utility here that's publicly operated, U.S., does not sell water and electricity that way. And arguably, those are commodities much, much more important to your daily happiness than whether you have health insurance. Because you can go years without any interface with the healthcare system. You don't even want to go a day without water or electricity. That's a bad day for you. And if you suggest to EWIP that they stop with it, that water and electricity are fundamental human rights and they should all be free at point of consumption, well, they're not going to accept that argument very well. And if they do, they're going to impose a whole bunch of backdoor taxes to make up for it. And then when water and electricity are free, 
consumption is going to go up, and most of you who are environmentalists are going to say, well, that's a bad thing. We should be pricing this so that people don't overconsume. I say, exactly. Now you're getting to catch on to what's wrong with our current health care system. People are overinsured and overpaying for things they shouldn't have insurance for. So auto insurance does not cover get gas, oil changes, new oil, uh, new tires. If it did, it wouldn't be insurance. You probably know about the uh, ACA 10 essentials that have to be on every plan. Hospital care, maternity, newborn care, lab services, substance abuse counseling, whether you want them or not. But that is nothing. <coughs> Oregon has 50 essentials. Must be in every plan. Hearing aids, mammograms, tobacco use cessation, advice from a clinical social worker. To confirm for this uh, speech today, I wanted to make sure of this, so I had a, one of my research assistants call the regulatory agency, and after a week of calling, they finally did, in fact, confirm. They gave me a PDF. I actually brought extra copies in case you're interested. The 50 essentials right here. Every single plan has to have all these. And if you're of a certain age, like my wife and I are, where contraception and maternity and newborn is definitely not anything we want to be considering. It doesn't matter. We're paying for it because it's essential, because our governor says it's essential, or legislators have said it's essential. It's not insurance. <clears throat> but we have 50 of them, and a lot of legislators who mandated that feel really good about themselves because we get all this stuff. Um, you know, if all you want is an insurance policy to protect you, from an unlikely medical crisis. You can't buy one. I've tried. We, my house, for the two of us, we pay about $1,600 a month. We have what's called catastrophic care, got an HSA, and that should be way, way, way cheaper. And it's not because it's not really a lot. So what's the problem that uh, single payer advocates are trying to solve? In 2017, 94% of Oregonians had health coverage. For those 0 to 18 years old, 97% were covered. For those over 65, 99.6% covered. The least insured, logically, 26 to 34, 88% of them were covered. <clears throat> 245,000 people were not insured, and 29%, or 71,000, said that they were not interested. Now, analytically, let's going forward, let's divide the population into groups. You have 65 plus, they're on Medicare. Children, low income, pregnant women, they're probably on Medicaid. Public employees, they have really expensive health care programs. Private sector individual, individuals covered by their employer. And then people like me, individuals who purchase on the open market. What are some possible solutions? Uh, first, legalized catastrophic care. Low cost, high deductible, pure insurance. Encourage or require health savings accounts. Money you can put away, your money, in a tax sheltered account being invested. I have money in my essay right now in a surplus money in a low cost index fund making money for me and then I can get access to it for routine things. And I can roll it over into my retirement account eventually. And discourage third party payments as much as possible. How would we apply that in real life? First of all, the 65 plus Medicare group, I, I view that as a group that we can't do much about in Oregon, and so I'm just not gonna I'm not gonna talk about it. It's not really possible for us to reform that. <clears throat> Medicaid now that's the most expensive program in Oregon. 35% of total state expenditures compared to only 18% a decade ago. 27% of the population is eligible, that's 1 million people. And in 2007, that's only 9%, so that's a huge growing number. The annual cost is $9.3 billion, or $9,300 per person. And the annual cost is growing much faster than state revenues. So what if we converted payments in uh, all these Medicaid payments, you know, the, the Medicaid recipient doesn't see any of the money. It's a use it or use it, use it or lose it benefit. It's all money sloshing to the other side of the table to the healthcare system. What if we converted that to health and savings accounts, accounts actually owned by the poor recipient as a property right that they could uh, <coughs> couple with catastrophic care plan and as an asset that they, they could own for life? If they own the money and they spent it like someone with a SNAP card, a current benefit card, shop where they want. That would totally change their perspective. It'd be very empowering, and they'd be a lot more interested in knowing how much stuff actually costs. Public employees, the state pays $1.7 billion annually for health care. Average premium, $17,000. Only $12,000 in Washington State, by the way. Worker contributes 5%. How about if we convert those to uh, ESA catastrophic care? 
they say, well, put 70, we'll save 25% of the money, put it back in the state general mm -hmm. fund. 75% goes to you, and it's gonna help savings account that you personally <coughs> own, and a cash out of care coverage plan. Suddenly, people would be a lot more empowered to look out for their own health care. Employees of private firms, same thing. Families buying the open market, <clears throat> like I do. Same thing, except allow me a lower cost catastrophic care plan. I just close by saying that there is a plan in Singapore, it's been around since 1984. They have Medisave accounts. Um, I think there are some attractive features to this. <clears throat> the, everyone has to contribute to a Medisave account, but it's their account, it's their asset, they own it. It can be bequeathed to your heirs. Funds can only be withdrawn for health care. Uh, you must put in a defined share of your earnings into your own account each year. Pay out of pocket for routine expenses, so you actually are paying, and you know what each thing is, you, you talk about it, routine visits, that kind of stuff. Accounts report can be topped off by outside money, and so it's a, that becomes a clear welfare transfer, but we know what it is. You can use your Medisave account to pay for the hospital bill for yourself, as well as someone in your family if you want to help them. And they pair it with something called a MediShield Life which is a true catastrophic care plan. I'm not searching for utopia here, but um, I think these are things that can move in the right direction, which is we need to minimize third party payers, have, have pricing, and markets. Thanks for your time. Okay, well, with those thoughts ringing in our head, we will now uh, break for five minutes to allow people to formulate questions. I expect to see a large crowd over by the microphone when we come back. Thank you. Thank you. Does single payer health care belong in Oregon? Before we proceed to the questions, I'd like to recognize our gold sponsor, Sacred Earth Botanical, Emergency Veterinary Hospital, arriving by bike. And special thanks to KRBN 91.9, radio, fast and photography, pack info, and simplified computing, LLC, and public radio station KLCC 89.7 uh, for airing City Club programs on Monday evenings at 6.30, and to community television of Lane County, cable channel 29 for televising recent City Club programs. We'll now begin questioning. Uh, I remind you to keep your questions to one minute so you don't incur the bell of shame. <laughs> Hello, I'm Dr. Henry Elder. I'm uh, the uh, chair of Healthcare for All Oregon in Lane County. Uh, Dr. Metz, I'm, I'd like to ask you to uh, address the issue of increased taxes as a result of uh, of the um, of universal health care, and a second and a question of legalizing insurance as a solution to that. Thank you, Hank. Uh, remember the discussion uh, that I uh, brought up about the many different ways that we pay for health care. Right now, probably. Uh, a third of what we pay in health care are in taxes. Perhaps, well, close to a half of the spending in Oregon, health care spending, comes from taxes. If we convert everything that we currently pay, the premiums and out of pocket payments, into taxes for a single payer, it's all going to be taxes. Now, if you just, if you're wedded just to reducing taxes, and the way to reduce your taxes is to stop paying for Medicare and Medicaid. If your goal is to get better care to more people for less money and to reduce the total cost to your family, total cost, and ensure that your family has access to health care, and you're willing to convert everything you currently pay into taxes, then your taxes will go up. Your discretionary income is improved your access to health care is improved, and your year-to-year -year expenditures are stable. If that's a sufficient reward for relabeling which are already paying into taxes, then let's do it. Legalizing insurance. I take a different approach 
than, than John does to insurance in healthcare. We don't want insurance. What we want is access. So American private insurance, private health insurance, is a really lousy, inefficient way to get health care to people who need it. It is a way to get health care to people who can afford it. But every country finds it very easy to provide health care to the healthy and wealthy. That's not a challenge. The challenge is how do we get health care to people who are sick and can't afford it? Insurance is not the way to do that. The way to do it is to pool our resources like we do for fresh water. And I think I'll stop there and take the next question. Ralph? Hello, I'm Ralph Pleasure. I've been a member for about three years, and I'm asking a question for a guest, and it's principally uh, directed at Mr. Charles, but uh, uh, the other uh, speaker can respond if he wants. What do we do about the people who have no income from which they can draw and put into a health savings plan? Yeah, that's, that's a good question. And we in Oregon are spending over $9 billion a year for that demographic as it is. And so my suggestion is First, don't let the perfect be the enemy of the good. For most people, most of the time, in most years, they spend less than $1,000 a year on health care. And an HSA coupled with a catastrophic care plan would work great for them. Everybody else, we can do something different. And certainly for the uh, $9,300 that we spend per year on average for people on Medicaid, low income, pregnant women, uh, <coughs> others who qualify for Medicaid, a million Oregonians. That $9,300 is, is going by on a conveyor belt. They never touch it. It just goes from someone to the government through tax, our taxes to the government to the other side of the table, health care providers. I think if you ask them directly, would you rather have $9,300 a year float by you so that you can go to the doctor once in a while, or, or can we cut a deal and say we'll give you instead oh, 7000 a year in a health savings account that you have a property right to, that's an asset on your income statement, that you own for life, and you can bequeath to others, that you pay from that, like with a food stamp card, a stamp card, you pay for all your stuff you want day to day, and if you don't spend it all, you roll it in the next year, and you could have quite a bit of money over time, uh, coupled with a true catastrophic care plan that the public can pay for as a backstop to the you know 90 days in a hospital that's going to wipe you out. <clears throat> you ask them which they want, I believe you would have a stampede of people who would be thrilled to take the suggestion that I'm offering instead of us spending nine billion dollars a year that at the end of the year the million people that you're talking about have zero assets to keep out of that and may never have even used the service. I believe there's a great misunderstanding on what the economy is now. I think the historical parallel is 1929, the year before the Great Depression. Um, and we're seeing every month large numbers of people freshly homeless here in Eugene. And if half the cause of mm. bankruptcy is medical cost right now in the United States and probably worse in Oregon from what I can tell, um, how can you justify more medical bankruptcies? Uh, Jerry, does that address to anybody in the visual? Does that address to either of the speakers? Uh, we don't like people. This is for the radio audience. This is Sam. I, I'm the good guy. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm against medical bankruptcy. And what we find is 
that the places that don't have medical bankruptcies are the places that compel people to participate in health care plans. And if we ask these people, would you sooner be compelled to participate in your country's health care plan, or would you like to try to get health care in the United States? The majority say, I'll stay right here, thank you very much. In the U.S., we don't have the option of paying or not paying for health care when we need it. Most of our payments are when we get sick, which is a really lousy time to try to pay for health care. So, just to be sure, I'm against medical bankruptcies. I suspect that John is as well. John, do you have a response to that? Hi, this is for uh, Dr. Metz. Section 1332 of the Affordable Care Act allows waivers for state innovation. That allows a state to craft their own health care plan as long as it covers the same amount of people with basically the same coverage at a cheaper cost. So my question is, why don't we utilize that section, the state of Oregon, to craft its own public option to bring costs down and create competition? And secondly, why don't we get together with other states like California and Washington and create a regional plan and that way that entire region would be able to negotiate drug prices and get that, those prices way down. Thank you. Thank you for that question. I'm going to pour cold water all over that, unfortunately. The waivers from the Affordable Care Act only allow waivers from the Affordable Care Act. We spend about $36 billion a year in Oregon on health care, and over 85% of that spending is regulated by some federal law. And the Affordable Care Act only covers a small fraction of that. Medicare, Medicaid, Federal Employees Health Benefit Program, Children's Health Insurance Program, uh, ERISA for everything that employers spend, those are federal laws that prevent Oregon doing anything rational with health care. Some of these programs have waivers that are difficult to get, like the Affordable Care Act, and some of them are impossible. Until we have federal enabling legislation that is something from Congress that says, if you comply with the requirements of the waiver for the Affordable Care Act, we'll also waive everything else we're just flapping our wings to try to fly to them. We have to wait for Congress to do something rational in health care. If you're going to do that, you should pack a lunch. <laughs> uh, Ruth Stamler, and this is the question for Dr. Mann. Um, Dr. Mr. Charles would like to also say something. Um, I'm concerned about the shortage of doctors. My doctor told me this last week. I'm sorry, but I can no longer continue my practice with this group. I was asked to serve 1,700 patients. Can you imagine serving 1,700 patients and doing a job that's expected of you to serve? 1,700 patients are uh, maybe two minutes uh, every six months. So I phoned and tried to get a, a new doctor that was recommended to me. I have a July appointment. This, um, this all makes me very concerned, and I wonder why we don't have any doctors. We really don't. We have a, a severe shortage here. And uh, I was wondering if you had some answers to why we don't have any doctors. Thank you. Maybe it's a $500,000 cost. So going to school to be a doctor could help. Uh, everything that uh, Ruth said is true. Uh, imagine under a single payer system in which the cost of providing health care has just plummeted because billing has been simplified. Everyone has the same policy. Every patient is a paying patient. Overhead goes down, and every patient is going to pay you the same. 
all of a sudden, if Oregon does this, we look pretty attractive. There will be a lot of people demanding health care who didn't get health care before. In the uh, RAND report of universal care in Oregon two years ago, it called that congestion. Usually, when supply exceeds demand in a business, we call that an economic stimulus, business opportunity, and job creation. <coughs> What's discouraging about being in medicine today is the paperwork. You don't have to ask many physicians about why they're feeling burnt out, but it's the administrative cost in time, energy, and money that is discouraging physicians. If we can release all of that administrative paperwork and save them time, money, and energy, we're very likely going to see that Oregon will be the go-to place to practice medicine. I just commented, this is John Charles. Uh, I don't share Sam's optimism about this kind of system. I believe if you had a single-payer system, uh, you would make the practice of medicine much less attractive. There would be zero chance for them to be entrepreneurs. They would probably not get paid the way they believe they should. They would be part of this robotic system. And I believe we need not only to free consumers from the tyranny of the third-party payer system, we need to do free doctors as well and unleash uh, their creativity as entrepreneurs to try all kinds of different things about how to run a medical practice. Hi, Beck Bobby, City Club member, and this is almost a follow-up to your question, I mean your comment. So this is for John. What's wrong with the Canadian single-payer system? <laughs> Well, I think what people get is access as long as they're willing to wait a long time. Not so, true. Not, yes, not true. So, so lot, lots of people. Yeah. Uh, so, there's no, there's no doubt that lots of people who live in Canada come over to the States to get their health care taken care of. And it may work for some people, and that's fine. I'm not Canadian, and I don't try and impose other people's system on us or vice versa. Uh, I personally am skeptical. That, that would work very well. I'm a lot more interested in the system from Singapore than I mentioned, and I guess I'll just leave it at that. John Bill, City Club Network, and this is for John. Um, I didn't hear you mention anything about pre existing conditions in any of your proposition. Again, most people don't have pre existing conditions, so I don't think I don't think we should say that they will design the whole system for that group. So if you want a real insurance system, then you have to allow risk to be measured. And we have various sources of money, including, in my view, the Oregon Lottery, which generates more than a billion dollars of money from non tax sources. Most of the lottery money is wasted now by the Oregon legislature and goofy economic development schemes. <coughs> that money, mm -hmm. some of that should be diverted to backstop mm -hmm. Uh, policies where people have people who sort of lost the DNA lottery and they have these pre existing conditions that are difficult to ensure. Fine, we, we can make those people whole. Don't ruin an insurance system because it happens to be harsh for some people. Let's just have an open, same as the SNAP program, is a, a, is a known expenditure from American taxpayers to people that allows them to supplement their food budget in a very open way. We know how much we're spending, and the way that it is administered through electronic debit cards works better for them and for the stores who are competing for all that money in the embedded card. Uh, we can help people with, with pre existing conditions in some similar market based way. But don't <clears throat> skew the entire system just because of, of this problem that might be a third of the population, 25% of the population, certainly not 90% of the population. Thank you. Thank you. Sharon Reed, uh, City Club member. Uh, for Dr. Metz, um, how do you recommend or are there some thoughts about how we would transition to a single payer um, system that would not cause you know, chaos or problems? Uh, thank you. 
Uh, first, I'd like to remind the audience that John and I have the mic and you don't. So if you've got cat calls, you have to line up over here and wait your turn, or you can assault us afterwards. Uh, the transition, uh, the, the quick, smart, uh, disdainful answer is you cannot leap across a chasm in a series of small steps. There is no way you can tweak our current chaotic system and move it step by step toward universal care. Our healthcare system was never designed to provide universal care. It's an industry. It will not reform itself. Remember that when you have an industry, it's run for the benefit of the people who own the industry. The, the car industry in the United States is not committed toward making every, giving every person personalized transportation that's affordable, economic, and non-polluting. They owe them what they deliver. Their whole mission is to take care of their own. This is not a system that we can move incrementally. Uh, John again, and this is for Sam. Uh, I'm retired, and I pay part of my uh, uh, Social Security to Medicare and taxes. If we go to a single payer, am I going to be still paying that tax plus the tax for the single payer? <laughs> It's going to be an unpopular comment. Medicare is the world's worst single-payer system. It is inefficient. It's dysfunctional. It does not prevent people from really severe financial hardship. That said, it's a whole lot better than what seniors would get if we didn't have Medicare. And it still provides better care for our seniors than they could ever possibly get from private insurance. So, when this idea of Medicare for all really gives me the willies. <laughs> if the U.S. is going to a single-payer system and level it and build up, we should not expand Medicare as we know it, as dysfunctional as it is, and make it nationwide. Now, more directly to your question, the vision of single-payer is every year all of us pay fixed taxes into a health care fund. And it's prepaid. When we get sick, we get help. No matter who we go to, that provider will get paid. And no matter who we are, that provider will get paid the same whether we have pearls or tattoos. And it doesn't matter how old you are, how sick you are, who you work for, where you live, your prepayment stays the same and your access to health care stays. Hi, <clears throat> my question is for um, John Charles. Okay, thank you. Um, are you in agreement that the current system is not working? And I just want to clarify, are you in agreement that the current system is not working? You're proposing a system more like the health saving plan of Singapore. That's, sorry, one question. And. Um, are you suggesting that we need to protect shareholders and um, protect jobs? And how does that relate to like 150 years ago when you, we probably put a lot of wagon drivers out of work when the automobile was invented? And you know, how do we evolve? Are we always protecting old jobs and old industries which have an investment in surviving uh, when we should be evolving into a different type of of, um, of, of society, and I'm going to leave it at that. <laughs> uh, to answer your second question first, I'm not suggesting that we <clears throat> just randomly protect companies from uh, market forces. I don't think we should, should have bailed out, uh, you know, Radio Shack or uh, Sears or other companies that. You know, went out of business. That that happens. But if you're proposing to, uh, in some people's versions of single payer, is to take all the money now on the table 
Medicaid, Medicare, private insurance, and basically put private uh, companies, make them irrelevant, or put them out of business. I'm just saying, you know, they all have lobbyists. There are politicians. They, they're not going to just stand by, and nor would you if you had a large part of your portfolio go down the drain because the state or the country sort of nationalized an industry, as if were some um, other countries that, that do those sorts of things. That's not really a very American way to do things. And I, I don't think, when you leave here, you go into the state capitol or the Congress, they're going to impose a whole other set of sort of political realities on that conversation. And I forget the first part of your question, I'm sorry. <laughs> um. Well, oh yeah, okay. this is John speaking. Well, I, I believe the current system is dysfunctional. I certainly agree with Dr. Metz that Medicare is a, is very dysfunctional. I call it a Ponzi scheme. <clears throat> but I also have spent quite a bit of time, I've lobbied in the state legislature every single session since 1981. So I view myself as being in the idea business. And then I enter the state capitol, and all of my youthful idealism then gets ground into dust, even though I'm not youthful anymore. So when you go to them, it's great to have a vision of what you want, but most things happen by, by what the academics call creaking incrementalism. So for the things that I'm proposing, I might suggest as creeping incrementalism that, okay, well we know the Medicaid expansion in Oregon has become unsustainable. We know that the costs of it are growing at a far, far higher rate than state income, and that PowerPoints that circulate around the capital show that you know, between PERS and Medicaid, the state budget is getting just crushed. So if you have a crisis, a crisis is something you shouldn't waste. So we know all of that. Why not experiment with this $9.3 billion annual expenditure uh, and uh, maybe have some kind of opt-out program for these people that we're spending $9,300 a year on? How about if we give, instead of $9,300, offer $7,000? But it goes in an account that you personally own. It's now an asset. Just yes or no. Do you want it? Can we experiment? Can we do a pilot project? Okay, now for the 90 let's state legislators and the governor, the pilot project, small scale, low risk, uh, lower the state cost. They begin to recognize that as something they could consider. That's all I'm suggesting. You know, the real big picture things, including you know, oh Singapore, let's import Singapore to here. That's not going to go anywhere. I'm just I'm just referencing Singapore as something that has existed since 1984. It does have a mandatory contribution, as Dr. Metz said, except it's a mandatory contribution every year from your income to your own HSA that you own, not to some third party payer that you don't have anything to do with. Okay, but grafting that onto either anything Congress would do or the state legislature would do politically, that's a gigantic leap. So I'm not saying that I know how to get there. Same here. Um, I have a question about what you consider, um, Mr. Charles, um, the pre-existing condition. It seems like if you're human, it's a pre-existing condition. Certainly for half the population um, of women, just the ability to give birth is a pre-existing condition. So given the fact, if you accept that premise, if, if then we don't have a market of supply and demand. We have a constant demand and supply holding all the cards. So that leads to monopolies and it leads to discrimination in service. And it leads to very high prices. So I don't know to understand why you define it as a market and why you define pre-existing conditions as only pathological, for instance, having a disease. John, you have to go a minute to answer my question. Uh -huh. yeah, I mean, markets arise uh, naturally. People like to barter and trade over the back fence. It's allowed. Markets are everywhere. <clears throat> we don't have many markets in this business because of government intervention. That's typically the case. The government intervention is typically worse than the problem. If you look at something like auto insurance, I want them to measure risk. I want them to recognize I'm not a 17-year-old male the highest risk people to insure. I'm over 60, I have a great driving record, I don't smoke, I only live five miles from my office. All those things lead me to have really low rates. That's what I want. If you call it discrimination, then I want to be discriminated. Uh, it rewards certain things. Now admittedly, 
if you're at the wrong end of that discrimination, especially for things in the healthcare industry where it's, sorry, I lost the DNA lottery or something, I can't help that this is expensive, fine. Let's create something humane and workable and cost effective for that group, a backstop, a, a transfer in. Okay. Unfortunately, we're running out of time, although you are invited to attack these guys. That's the word you They invite you, Sam invites you, I invite you. Um, before we close and thank our speakers, uh, next week we have uh, the Snowed Out program uh, on the opioid overdose crisis, how we got here and what to do about it with Doug Bovey on Friday, April 12th, lunch with the mayor on Friday the 19th. Uh, and this is a new addition, uh, Congressman Pete DeFazio will be here on Congress's spring break to tell us what's going on in Washington. Uh, on uh, Wednesday, April 23rd, at Tsunami, Eric Richardson will interview Lahui Wayfair. And on Friday, April 26th, the courthouse bond issue, how should I vote? Uh, the pros and cons of the bond issue. Uh, in addition to thanking our speakers, I'd like to thank uh, Mary Leighton and uh, Hank Elder for suggesting this program and coordinating this program and give a big round of applause for our speakers. Thank you for being here today. Thank you for being here You know, then the other thing I noticed is that he uh, applies freedom of choice, which was designed in So a strict constructionist shouldn't probably want to do that.